Greetings, my name is James Moore and I am the Executive Director for the Todd Anthony Bell National Resource Center on the African American Male at The Ohio State University. I want to personally thank you for joining us these past two weeks. This week, we will be discussing the impact that COVID-19 has had on the black community, as well as discuss briefly how COVID-19 has changed things specifically, how we are now all virtual for this colloquium. Please remember to engage in conversation via the chat function with each other and the speakers. This platform is an excellent way to create community, even though we are online. Again, thank you for joining us for week three and taking time to discuss these very important topics. Please enjoy today's colloquium. Take care. Hello, my name is Dr. Sherry Ann Charleston and I'm the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Harvard University. I am thrilled to be with you at ICBME this year, even though we're doing it virtually. For years now, ICBME has been a wonderful experience for me as I've tried to deepen my knowledge and understanding of how we can intentionally think about supporting black males in the context of the educational pipeline through higher education. Thank you, Dr. Moore and Dr. Jackson, for your tireless energy, for your commitment to this work, and for continuing to create spaces and opportunities for scholars and generations of future scholars to start to delve deeply into some of the most pressing issues that face us today. As all of you all know, we're facing unprecedented times, but I'm heartened by the fact that this space exists and that it gives us an opportunity to really start to be solutions oriented in our approach to the problem. Looking forward to being with you all in future years and looking forward to resuming the Graduate School Academy where I've been co-director and look forward to working again with so many young scholars who are starting to do this work and will continue to carry us forward. God bless and take care. There are two serious pandemics that have plagued African-Americans. One has been here since its inception and that's racism. And the other is, is COVID-19. Those two are, are vicious, you know, pandemics that are impacting the lives uh, and the quality of life of African Americans in this country. In some communities, the pandemic appears to be disproportionately affecting people of color. African Americans are among the hardest hit here. Uh, data is just beginning to emerge, so it's still early days. But take a look at this information compiled by the Washington Post overnight. The Washington Post reporting that counties that are majority black have three times the rate of infections as counties that are majority white. Those counties have almost six times the rate of deaths and of Chicago's 118 reported deaths. The Washington Post finds that nearly 70 percent of those people were black. That is uh, way out of proportion with uh, Chicago's general demographics. Of the 40 people who have died so far because of the coronavirus in your county, what percentage of those people are black? Right now, it's still about 80 percent. African Americans make up 26 percent of the population? Correct. Pre-COVID, you had a higher, dis a higher proportion of individuals with hypertension, with diabetes, with obesity. These things that are the leading causes of death in the country and the, chronic the leading chronic diseases in this country. It's not surprising that individuals that already had that higher proportion of those immunocompromised diseases would then be at the higher end of the toll. This uh, viral pandemic is essentially intersecting with the epidemic of obesity, the epidemic of homelessness, and the epidemic of poverty. The doctors have noticed a worrying trend. Many of the patients are people of color, specifically African Americans. Despite making up only 23% of Houston's population, the latest figures show African Americans account for around 66% of COVID deaths. People of color generally are more susceptible to diseases, and we know that they have those pre-existing conditions, the diabetes, the heart disease, the asthma, that makes them more likely to suffer consequences because of coronavirus. And part of the reason they have that is there is a genetic component behind that, because we know that some of these things like high blood pressure in African Americans tends to be worse. Uh, but also at the same time, we know that there's some socioeconomic conditions that are causing them to be in situations where they're not only more likely to get coronavirus, but also more likely to suffer 
suffer the consequences behind it. High quality primary and preemptive care can often be absent and unaffordable in poorer neighborhoods and communities. The lack of access to healthy food sources is another factor that accounts for the stark difference in numbers of COVID-19 related deaths in predominantly African-American and white communities. Most of our patients are poor. Uh, most of our patients live in health deserts. Uh, most are uninsured or underinsured. Uh, most are unemployed and have other disproportionate impact, what we call social determinants of health. We're noticing more black and brown and immigrant patients that are seeking care. And a lot of these patients are um, essential workers. Uh, a lot of them are service workers. We, as a people, as African Americans, have jobs that require us to be at work. For so many African Americans, there isn't this ability to telecommute. They tend to have those jobs that put them out in the forefront of having to contact other people, having to go to work, and being more likely to get coronavirus and the consequences of it. African Americans would be more likely to have a blue collar job, which requires them to travel to work. They don't necessarily have the, the luxury of being able to stay at home uh, and self isolate. They, all of the hypertension, asthma, heart disease, all of those problems that are more prevalent in African American communities due to uh, stress, lifestyle, historical racism and all, all kinds of other problems, you'd have to attack that cluster of problems in order to really fix this. The improvement of the unemployment rate wasn't felt by all Americans. For black workers, the rate continued to rise in May as African Americans bear the brunt of the economic downturn brought on by the coronavirus. Among white Americans, last month's unemployment rate dropped almost two points. But among black workers, it actually rose slightly. They're also more likely to be first fired last rehired. Millions of black Americans are financially fragile. Median white family net worth is 10 times that of a median black family. Black people make up 13% of the U.S. population. They hold less than 3% of the nation's wealth. To that wealth gap, that's a clear reach back to those early days. We've never gotten on firm footing. So when you talk about access to um, good good loans and housing, right. uh, home ownership isn't a wealth driver, it is the wealth. There's a crazy wealth gap between white and black Americans that's tied to home ownership. White Americans hold seven times the wealth of black Americans, the same ratio as in the civil rights era. And even though black people make up nearly 13 percent of the U.S. population, they hold less than 3 percent of the nation's wealth. Now you have to understand that owning property is the major way American families build wealth. But when state-mandated discrimination stops black people from owning their homes, the growth of their wealth gets halted too. By the time housing segregation was banned in the Fair Housing Act of 1968, it was too little, too late. The damage was already done for generations. The inequity of home ownership had launched a domino effect that made it far too difficult for black families to try and purchase homes in similar suburbs. Racially segregated neighborhoods have a grave impact on many realms of American life. Where you live can determine what kind of education is available for your children, how much wealth you can have, your relationship with law enforcement, and even your own family's health. The biggest takeaway from all of this? Racial segregation and the wealth gap in the U.S. is not just due to personal prejudice or private actions. Instead, it's a direct result of state-sanctioned policies intended to stop Black Americans from achieving success that in many ways continues today. Greetings. I'm Brian Burt, Assistant Professor of Higher Education in the Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis Department at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. I also serve as Research Scientist in the Wisconsin Equity and Inclusion Laboratory, also known as the WeLab. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker. Dr. Andre Perry is a Fellow in the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings, a Scholar-in-Residence at American University and a columnist for the Hetchinger Report. A nationally known and respected commentator on race, structural inequality, education, and economic inclusion, Perry is a regular contributor to MSNBC and has been published by the New York Times, The Nation, The Washington Post, TheRoot.com, and CNN.com. Perry has also made appearances on CNN, PBS, National Public Radio, NBC, and ABC. Perry's recent scholarship at Brookings has analyzed black majority cities and institutions in America, focusing on valuable assets worthy of increased investments. 
His research spotlights the struggles of black businesses, including artists and art institutions, restaurants, and barbershops and beauty salons as they await federal relief from COVID-19's economic impact. In education, he explained how college campus closings put housing insecure students at risk during the pandemic. He's also written on the unrealized value of teachers' work that has been made apparent by COVID-19 and has commented on the potential loss of black teachers as a result of an impending recession. Prior to his work at Brookings, Perry worked in several capacities in the field of education. In 2015, Perry served on Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards' K-12 Education Transition Committee in the state of Louisiana, as well as on New Orleans Mayor Mitch Landrieu's transition team as its co-chair for education in 2010. In 2013, Perry founded the College of Urban Education at Davenport University in my hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Preceding his stint in Michigan, he was an associate professor of educational leadership at the University of New Orleans and served as CEO of the Capital One University of New Orleans Charter Network. Perry is the author of the new book titled Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities, which is currently available wherever books are sold. He will be speaking more about his work today. A native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Perry earned his PhD in educational policy and leadership from the University of Maryland College Park. On a personal note, I have known Dr. Perry for almost two decades when he was a doctoral student and I was a master's student at the University of Maryland College Park. Like then, today, I'm excited to hear Dr. Perry's thought-provoking insights. Please welcome Dr. Andre Perry. Hi, I'm Andre Perry, fellow at the Brookings Institution, and I'm happy to join you at ICBME for this 2020 edition. Um, I'm going to present to you today on um, worthy of investment, the, the valuation of assets in black communities. And a lot of what I'm going to discuss can be found in my book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. Um, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm a fellow at the Brookings Institution and I study black majority cities. Um, here's a, a map of the cities where the share of the black population is greater than 50%. There are over um, 1,200 of those cities, um, all, um, many of which have assets in them that if we invested in, you would see greater wealth and opportunity. And, and that's generally what I do at the Brookings Institution. My story begins at home. As you can see here, this is, uh, this is a house. It's located in uh, Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania, a small municipality surrounded by Pittsburgh on three sides. Uh, the, the house is boarded up. No one has lived in the, the, the home for years. Um, and the home is essentially worth the price of picking up the taxes on it. The municipality now owns that home. But the home is worth a lot more to me um, for um, reasons I'm about to share. The woman in the upper right-hand corner, her name is Elsie Boyd. I call her mom. This, as the story was told to me when I was born, a deal was made between my maternal grandmother and mom that she would then take me in um, because, my, because my mother was poor. Um, she already had a child. Um, she was actually probably abused. Um, and as you could see, other children joined me along the way. So mom reared about 12 to 15 kids for varying durations. Um, some would stay uh, a week, some would come daily um, for babysitting. Others would stay for months. I stayed, my brother stayed until um, we graduated from high school. Um, one of the reasons why my father, pictured here in the Afro, uh, he was drug addicted. He was a heroin addict and he was in and out of prison. He eventually was murdered inside Jackson State Penitentiary in Michigan now known as Michigan Penitentiary. 
Um, but um, the story was told to me, he died breaking up a fight in prison. But I wanted, as for my book, I wanted this to uh, travel to where he lived and died and examine the overall conditions in which um, he um, uh, lived. So m that journey started by examining home prices. As you can see here, um, uh, this chart on the x-axis is you see the share of the black population in the neighborhood. Um, um, and as the, and on the y-axis indicated by the numbers on top, um, you see the price of homes in those zip codes or neighborhoods. Um, and then you, you can see here that the homes in neighborhoods where the share of the black population is less than a percent, um, those homes are priced in general about $340,000. And as you climb up the, that x-axis where the share of the population is 50% or higher, the average listing price is about half as much. But a lot of people will say that's because of education, um, crime, and, and, but those are things you can control for in the study. That's what we did. We looked at the absolute price difference, um, that, that number you saw earlier, then we controlled for structural characteristics. Um, so the, the, the number of rooms, the size of the home. We wanted to get an apples to apples comparison um, between them. Then we examined the neighborhood amenities. We, we controlled for education, crime, walkability, and all those fancy Zillow metrics that you find. And what we found pretty much astounds that homes in black neighborhoods are underpriced about 23%, about 48,000 per home. That's 156 billion in lost equity. And you can see that this devaluation is occurring all throughout the United States. Wherever you see a magenta circle, that's where devaluation is occurring. Wherever you see a green circle, that's where homes in black neighborhoods are priced higher than their white counterparts. Just to give you an example, uh, homes in, um, in black neighborhoods in the New York, New York, New Newark, New Jersey metro area are um, are priced about forty eight thousand less um, in black neighborhoods, and you can see all throughout the United States this is occurring. Lynchburg, for, for instance, Virginia, eighty one percent difference. Rochester, New York, sixty five percent difference. There are black majority places where homes are priced higher than their white counterparts. For instance, Boston, Massachusetts, 23% higher um, for homes in black neighborhoods, but let's be clear, Boston is no less racist than Lynchburg. I just wanna put 156 billion in perspective. It would have financed more than 4 million black owned businesses based on the average amount blacks used to start up their firms. It would have covered um, um, it would have paid for more than 8 million four-year degrees based on the average amount of a four-year degree. It would have replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan nearly 3,000 times over, covered all of Hurricane Katrina, Katrina damage, and it's about double the annual economic burden of the opioid crisis. This is why I say all the time there's nothing wrong with Black people that ending racism can't solve. You know, there's a white supremacist myth that says it's the state of black neighborhoods, um, cities and, and schools are a direct result of the people in them. The data is clear that the policies that created and creates lower housing prices contributes and, um, to the conditions uh, in black neighborhoods and it robs black people of the opportunities to lift themselves. Remember, that those, those dollars that are lost are also collected, they're supposed to be collected by municipalities to, to help educational services, um, policing, infrastructure, and other municipal services. So that 156 billion is a big number and it has a significant impact. I wanna share with you a clip 
from a hearing which I testified on Capitol Hill um, during a financial service committee hearing. This is a representative Al Green um, he, and he's basically asking us, is there discrimination in housing after viewing the data that I, I presented to you? Now, if there's one area where we know that there's discrimination is housing, lots of data on it, um, lots of studies. Um, but I just want you to hear this exchange with um, Representative Al Green. If you think black people are being discriminated when their property is being appraised, would you kindly raise your hand? One person on the panel. If you think that, for fear that I'm not communicating well, if you think that black people are not being discriminated against when their property is being appraised, if you think they're not being discriminated against, kindly raise your hand. Okay, hands now, we're getting some consternation, I see. Wow, now we know that most um, people start businesses using the equity in their homes. And so I wanted to examine that dilemma as well. You know, black people represent about 12% of the population, but only 2% of the nation's employer businesses, businesses with at least one employee. Only 1% of black business owners were able to obtain a loan in their founding year compared to 7%. And black entrepreneurs are denied bank loans more than twice as often as their white peers. And when we do get loans, we get them at higher interest rates. About half of black businesses survived the Great Recession compared to 60% of white owned firms. 95 of black owned businesses did not receive PPP loans as part of the CARES Act. And so that number is probably the the number of businesses that survived was probably going to worsen um, um, during this period. I want to introduce you to Doran Moorfield, founder and owner of Chef Grant uh, at Grandma B's. Um, he is uh, he's located in the Hill District of Pittsburgh. Um, he has a great Yelp rating, um, 4.6 out of five stars. Um, here he's holding up one of his um, great breakfast steaks, um, and they are good. But the Hill District is rapidly changing. In 2010, it was about 100% Black, uh, close to it. Now, in, in, in 2020, it's about 80% Black. Um, and um, Dorian will tell you that now um, he, the garbage pickup is, is more regular. The uh, lights are being fixed, the streets repaired, um, now that uh, alongside that, that white people are moving in. But I wanted to do the same um, experiment we did um, in, um, for housing. So we wanted to get a sense of quality of the business, to see what's going on, why aren't businesses receiving the investment they may deserve. So we looked at Dun & Bradstreet data to get a sense of bu business revenue in the race of the owner. Then we scraped Yelp data from all the businesses across the country to get a sense of quality but, but then we controlled for neighborhood characteristics, so education, um, wealth, um, spending power, things like that to get an apples to apples comparison of businesses. And what we found is black, brown, and Asian owned businesses are rated as high or, uh, or higher than white owned businesses on average using Yelp. But businesses in black neighborhoods receive 50 to 100 fewer reviews and as the concentration of blackness increases, um, the um, reviews and the scores go down. So I'll take a look at this chart. Again, black, brown, and Asian businesses um, consistently score higher on Yelp than their white counterparts. But um, as you can see, as the concentration of black people in a neighborhood increases, um, the, the Yelp rating decreases. Now, there's a reason, um, the, the impact is clear. Businesses in, in black neighborhoods get less revenue. Um, and it's costing businesses upwards of $3 billion in revenue. You know, there's a saying um, in our neighborhoods that we used to hear all the time, our ice is just as cold. Um, the, our elders knew that if you bypass quality in the hood, you essentially force 
quality businesses to compete with lower quality businesses. Um, you suppress uh, the profits and, then, and, and also you suppress economic mobility and result. And so our elders were right. Our ice is just as cold. And so our businesses diver, deserve significant investment. And, but, but we have to change the perception of the neighborhood um, in order to do that. But we also must restore the value that is extracted by negative perceptions. And how do you counter these issues? You have to, do, to invest in people um, first and foremost. Um, if you invest in place, and I talk about investing in place in, on, on the right side of this um, uh, chart, if you invest in place and not people, you essentially will help raise values and people living in the communities may not be able to keep up with the rising values in the property. So you essentially force gentrification. The, so you have to um, invest in people, direct capital towards minority owned firms, homeowners. Um, I say all the time, cut the check, cut the check. You have to invest in people. We must also remove unnecessary bureaucratic barriers for entry into entrepreneurship. You know, uh, what is clear um, from our research is that black business owners don't need to be placed in programs to build capacity. They just need investment. So um, my goal is to help folks realize that we need to drive investment towards business owners, homeowners, and others so that we can erase the um, extraction that is occurring in black neighborhoods. Um, but again, we must invest in place um, because of devaluation. Many neighborhoods are not seeing the kind of investments in their infrastructure. Um, they're not, they don't have beautification um, projects going on. Street lights are not fixed. Garbage is not picked up regularly. We have to invest in those, um, in those activities. And we also must part, um, find ways to encourage businesses to um, site in or to land in um, black neighborhoods. Um, and that's what I wanted to present to you today. Um, but I, I do wanna leave you with a message. Um, the, the title of my book is Know Your Price. And I get, it, I get it from my favorite play in the whole wide world, Two Trains Running. You know, in that play, the main character, Memphis, is about to have his property seized through eminent domain. City of Pittsburgh offers Memphis $15,000. Um, the main character, Memphis, goes, no, I'm not selling my property for $15,000. I got my price. I know my price. And it's a refrain throughout the, throughout the play. There's another character, Hambone, who paints a fence for a ham. And throughout, he paints a fence but never gets his ham. Throughout the play, he goes, give me my ham, give me my ham, give me my ham. Now, um, he never gets his ham, and we don't know if he had mental illness before um, painting the fence, but eventually he goes mad and dies dem demanding his ham. Now, there is actually a happy ending. The main character, Memphis, receives $35,000 for his efforts, um, well above the original asking price. And it's assumed he's getting market rate or the white rate. And the moral of the story is, no, you got to know you have worth. Um, but I try with this book to give people the price to stand on. Um, when, when you're talking about education, a lot of people say, well, what does it have to do with education? One, the, um, the loss in revenues are um, in the communities is what help fund that education. But... Um, the devaluation occurs at many different levels. It occurs in, in, in education, it occurs in, in healthcare. Um, black teachers are regularly devalued, particularly black women. And so we're going to have to figure out ways to invest in black people um, because, again, our ice is just as cold. We have got to stop this white supremacist myth that states the conditions of our schools, the conditions of our neighborhoods our institutions are a direct result of the people in them. No, um, the, 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 if there's 
if they're not showing growth, it's generally because of a lack of investment, not a lack of effort, not a lack of know-how, but a lack of investment. Nothing grows without investment. So I'm going to leave that with you. Um, and hopefully you gain some information from this brief session. But again, you can always go to learn more from my book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. Again, I want to thank you and um, farewell. Good day, everyone. My name is Liz Gillum. I am a PhD student at Florida State University studying education policy and evaluation. And I'm here with Alexander to debrief Dr. Perry's keynote address. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexander Pittman. I am a first year doctoral student at the University of Ohio State. Um, I'm in the teaching and learning department uh, with the concentration on multicultural and equity studies in education. I also work as a GA uh, in the Bell National Research Center. So one of the things, and I know that in our previous discussions, you and I talked about how Dr. Perry's talk was interesting, but it was also very sobering. Um, and it's not because there are things that we don't know that are happening in our communities, but it's you know, kind of putting it out there in plain sight, in plain terms. Um, when we talked about this, the $156 billion in lost equity that Black families live under and the different ways that that could present itself and solve a lot of the problems that we that our community faces. It was just really interesting to note that that could be any one of those problems being solved would help the Black community tremendously. Um, and I know we talked about looking at it from a critical race theory framework, how that calls on one to remember that, you know, the United States and all the systems that keep it flowing were built on, you know, facets of white supremacy and how it's really not in the best interest of the country to solve any of these problems because that kind of goes against the grain of what, what, what they're here for and what they're here to do. Would you, what would you say about that? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, just going off of that, when you think about uh, all the things that that $156 billion could go towards, uh, when you look at uh, uh, investment in the Black community or in Black-owned businesses, when you look at um, funding for, for education or after-school activities, um, you know, it's one thing that uh, Dr. Perry um, continued to go back to is the idea that uh, you have to have investment. You know, he ended the conversation saying nothing grows without investment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, America as a capitalist nation um, is very, uh, you know, they put their money what, towards what's important to them. And so the lack of money flowing towards um, Black communities, Black neighborhoods uh, is very telling. Um, and, uh, you know, like you said, these are not things that we were unaware of, um, but his, his analysis and his uh, explanation and, and also, you know, the, the graphs, the charts really make it um, just something that you can't ignore. You know, no one can look at that and say, you know, I really, I didn't understand. I don't see the connection. Um, and then also that clip from Congress where you see uh, our, our national <laughs> leaders saying that they, they don't believe that there's discriminatory practicing uh, in the appraising of, of Black people's homes and property. And so, there's, you know, some of these things are, um, they're, not, they're not new, but, but man, it's, it's definitely sobering um, and it's, uh, you know, eye-opening when you, when you hear these, um, the statistics and you have a, a research foundation to back it all up. So these are not people's opinions. Um, right. This is supported by evidence. Uh, and then you take into consideration the historical context, it just makes it even more, you know, um, pertinent to what's going on in our, our world right now, specifically in our country. You know, you mentioned the graphs and the things that, the equivalence that he showed. And it's almost like if you fix any one of these issues, you know, if you, if we could put that money into the black owned businesses, or if we could make sure that we had that 8.1 million more four year degrees, you know, if we could do any of those things, then the black community would be better. And it just, you know, it's not as though there is a request for all of them to be completed. 
obviously that would be wonderful, but you know, any one of those, just pick one. You know, if we could, you know, take care of the Katrina damage, that's an entire city that would flourish and thrive. If we could fix the Flint damage, I mean, he said 3000 times over, my goodness, you know, just that would be hugely helpful to us and it would allow us to continue to have that family legacy and that property and those things that really work in our favor. Um, when you mentioned the historical context, you know, I'm thinking of Tulsa and the Tulsa massacre and how, you know, there are, there were times that we did have our own and we had the property and we had the community and we had the businesses and we had these things and mobs decided that it wasn't what was in the best interest of their city. They didn't want it. They didn't want to see it. They destroyed it, you know, and then we've got the Jim Crow laws that also kind of worked toward undermining all of the progress that was being made. And so it kind of gets to the point where it's like, well, what is, the, how, how is this, how can we fix this? How do we, you know, kind of bridge this gap here? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, while you were um, bringing up Jim Crow and also talking about the Tulsa massacre, you know, I can't help but think about, uh, you know, in some of, of our readings, this idea of whiteness as a form of property. Uh, yes. and whiteness being um, actually something that is valued in this country. Uh, and a lot of times we see, um, you know, that comes through in, in kind of like subtle ways that are hard to uh, really quantify, hard to, to put your finger on. Um, but what's great is uh, through the discussion of the um, devaluation of black homes, but also when you look at the response to COVID-19 in the black community, these are two examples of tangible real ways that you can see that whiteness as a property is being valued more so than um, blackness. You can see it on a dollar amount, uh, at which Dr. Perry did a great job of kind of breaking down and showing. But then you can also see it uh, when you go to the CDC website and you look at some of the statistics of how COVID has affected, um, you know, the black community and not and not just the physical, but also the mental um, aspect of, of dealing with COVID, which everyone is going through. You know, this is it's not like COVID is a black issue by any means, um, but the statistics, the numbers show um, that COVID is having an even greater uh, uh, negative impact on the black community. Again, going back to that historical context and considering that for generations, uh, black home ownership, um, black education, um, and, and black communities have been uh, not at the forefront or, or even an afterthought uh, of our state and federal government. Well, of course, then when a, when a pandemic hits, uh, you know, these people that have been ignored historically are going to feel that even uh, heavier than people who have been historically looked out for because of that whiteness as a property. And so, um, you know, it's just really, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to continue to have these same conversations because you're giving examples from the Tulsa massacres from Jim Crow. I mean, these are historical examples uh, over a hundred years that these things should have, should not be at the forefront of our discussions about what, um, you know, how to improve our country. It'd be great to be having uh, discussions about other things that need to be improved. But again, that speaks back to the systems that are in play. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, it's a discussion that, like we started off saying, that is so important, but it's also so uh, sobering and, and a little bit disheartening even um, to, to continue to have to have these same conversations. Uh, but it's, it's that important and it's not going anywhere, it doesn't seem like. I love that you brought up the mental health aspect of it and the emotional aspect of it, because so often when in, in larger discussions of COVID and its impacts, people are so quick to only look at the death toll. Um, but there are so many other impacts that we are feeling, you know, if African Americans between 65 and 74 are dying at higher rates, we've got stress, we've got grief, and not just those that have passed on, but the family members they leave behind, you know, if there is an older person who is the breadwinner in their home, or the only parent or the only living grandparent or any of these things, and they lose their job or lose their life, that income is gone and that family is left behind to stress. And there's just a cascade of effects that come after that. You know, if there's income loss, housing is potentially lost. And then we end up back here, you know, kind of behind the eight ball because I need a job, 
but I can't, you know, I need a house, but I can't get a house without a job and all these things. And then, you know, if you have lost income, then there are a lot of families, quite a few families that have had to send older children to work in order to have some income. Well, then those students lose school time and then the school considers them truant. There's just a cascade of things that lead to not just emotional impacts from COVID, but then lead to other tangible impacts such as education loss and home loss and income loss and these things that just continue to keep our community in this sort of running on this treadmill almost. And it's, you know, if there could be a hand or a leg up to help us get off of this treadmill, then all kinds of things could happen. And I just, you know, you said it, it's disheartening because understandably the public health impacts of COVID-19 are what should be at the forefront of our government and it's mitigating the public health crisis. But that's just gotten to be so large that even looking at the other implications, the tangible ones, such as home loss and job loss, but also mental health and emotional health for, as you said, again, communities that have historically been looked over, that is, I'm sure, so far down the line that they're not even, you, how, how do we expect them to share its importance as a priority if they didn't do it before when we weren't in a pandemic? That's the, uh, the big question, absolutely. Um, something you said also, um, you know, triggered a, a, a thought about when you talked about, you know, students um, being forced to older students being forced to go to work as opposed to focus on their schoolwork. Uh, I spent the last 10 years before coming to Ohio State as a public school teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, and I saw this firsthand, you know, my my students, we left uh, for spring break on March 13th. And we, we never came back to school. Most of what we did uh, trying to as teachers trying to reach out to the students was just trying to get a feeling for how they're doing mentally, um, kind of like get a survey or assessment of, of how they're handling everything. And several of my students talked about how, you know, schoolwork is now at the back of their mind. They are working full time because their family saw this as necessary. You know, other people lost the job in the family. I can think of a couple of students specifically who were, went from working, say, 20 to 30 hours a week to 40 hours a week mm-hmm. during this pandemic. And so uh, and these students were, you know, where I was teaching was predominantly black and brown students. Um, and so, you know, when you when you said that, it just it really triggered because I I, I saw it firsthand. And, and, um, and, you know, these are not statistics. These are faces that I recognize. These are students that I know. And uh, it just makes it that much more real. Um, something else that I think is uh, worth uh, talking about is this living conditions as a social determinant for for your health, just to mm-hmm. tie it back into to COVID. You know, these your living conditions play a role in your uh, physical and mental health. And so, you know, when you think about um, the lack of investment in terms of uh, in terms of um, uh, schooling, and, and, and even something like uh, Dr. Perry gave the example of as this one neighborhood became more gentrified, that the trash was picked up on time, yes. uh, the, the lights began to be fixed. So, you know, living in a place where the trash was not picked up on times where you have to go out walking and the lights aren't working affect your physical health. Sure. And so now when we start seeing the manifestation of that um, through the discrepancies and disparities and how COVID has affected the black community, um, I mean, you know, these, it shouldn't be shocking to anyone because it's a clear correlation um, between the, between these, these um, aspects of life. And yet we've got members of Congress who say that there is no problem. You know, like you said, it shouldn't be shocking. It's, you can see it. And then, you know, again, dealing with COVID when you've got the loss of housing security or the loss of housing period, you know, the longer these apartments and buildings sit, the greater the chance for gentrification which just becomes another issue because then we've got more displacement of of families, of Black families and Black communities. And then it just, again, snowballs into this problem that, you know, likely will not be taken care of because once gentrification begins and the trash is picked up and the lights are fixed and these things are taken care of for the people who then live there, well, their living conditions are improved. So you know, it seems from the outside that things are doing better. Just to kind of go back towards 
this idea of devaluation. Um, you know, I, I always like to, as a doctoral student, I always like to make sure I have a good definition in front of me. And it said it says the reduction or underestimation of the worth or importance. There's the the number value, uh, and again, America's a capitalist nation. There, you know, they, they we make our decisions based off of bottom line, which I would argue is not the best way to make decisions. But that's another topic. But looking <laughs> at that importance, that's that's crucial because when you start devaluing people's homes, their neighborhoods, again, the mental aspect. I mean, this dates back to looking at, again, Brown versus Board of Education. How did that get passed? By having these young, uh, I believe young ladies look at dolls and decide who did they see more value in? Sure. And they picked these white dolls. For In our country's history, we have done so many things to show that Blackness is not valued. Dr. Perry's um, discussion really just highlighted that um, on another level, showed it in the housing but there's so many things that throughout our history, education, um, we have uh, redlining, all sorts of examples that have shown this to be true. Um, and that's why, you know, I'm, I'm so glad when we when we spoke via email, um, you started off with that, that critical framework because the critical framework always brings the historical context into question. The impact of COVID on the Black community without looking at the historical context. And I think that's where a lot of our our politicians and leaders are falling short. They want to look at it in a vacuum, but you cannot look at these things just in the past year or so when they've been built upon each other for the past hundred years or so. So um, it's just, um, you know, the Dr. Perry discussion was really, really um, great to, to see these things highlighted um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that it, it's, it's based off money because a lot of people in America only listen uh, when you start throwing dollar signs in there. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely very tangible. I also found it very interesting. You know, you mentioned worth and importance and I, wow, <laughs> you know, like that kind of, it hits you because it's, we know it's important. We know the the importance and the worth of, of having home value and equity and that legacy for your family. Um, and it is not value, the, the worth and importance of black property is not valued really outside of the community, but it, then it brings in the very interesting point that Dr. Perry brought up about the Yelp reviews and how minority owned businesses are consistently rated higher. Where does that translate? You know, <laughs> you know, and, and it obviously there are, there are uh, lots of factors, you know, the city that it's founded and all these other things, but you know, then he mentioned that the neighborhoods that these restaurants are in and it's almost as if, like you said, people are existing in a vacuum. You know, they drive in, they get their food, they get their, mm -hmm. and they leave, not recognizing how, you know, neighborhoods kind of look as they're driving. Um, in a sociology of education course that I taught last semester, we started off with the opening scene from The Hate You Give. And it took the students um, who came, who left their home and you were in the car with them as they drove from their home in the predominantly black part of town. And they drove through town to their school, which was in the predominantly white part of town. And as you drove, you could see how the stores and the neighborhoods and the people who hung around, you could see how all of that just sort of changed almost like you were going through a flip book. And so, you know, existing in a vacuum just seems very convenient, but it's something that doesn't really get to the root of the problem. And I think that if, the majority of people were to look at things from a critical theory, critical race theory framework, then the foundation that we talk about, the foundation of this country would topple. And I think there's some vested interest in making sure that doesn't happen. And I think that COVID is, while COVID is exposing a lot of those cracks in the foundation, I'm really interested to see how many people will be moved to improve things. It appears that, you know, a lot of the causes that have long been important to the Black community are being heard and taken seriously by many others outside of our community now. And it will be very interesting to see how long that renewed sense of vigor and activism will last and what good it will do to undo a lot of those systems and foundations that have been put in place that have been upheld for so long.
you know, speaking, we were talking about that that foundation beginning to crumble. If we really start to unpack things, um, it brings me to another quote that uh, Dr. Perry said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. But basically, the myth is that, uh, you know, the conditions of black cities, schools and neighborhoods are a direct result of the people who are living in them. Like you said, um, COVID hopefully, and, and also our social justice crusade that is happening right now mm -hmm. um, is shining a light on that um, and will allow people, uh, the people that are, who are not black um, to, to, to be willing to have these conversations um, and to be willing to have those conversations with their, their peers, uh, their family members mm -hmm. and, um, and their, their colleagues. And it might not be uh, the most comfortable conversation um, but at the same time, um, think about the level of, of discomfort that people deal with when they drive through those communities to get mm -hmm. to their food, uh, their restaurant, and they ignore what they see outside their windows as uncomfortable. They're willing to look past that um, and kind of be uncomfortable to get to what they ultimately want. So, you know, we would ask that uh, people are going to begin to kind of be willing to be uncomfortable um, to, to elevate other people, to elevate other voices, to um, share uh, the other side of the story, um, which Dr. Perry did a great job of, of doing in his, um, his presentation about uh, housing and home prices. Yeah, he definitely did. And I think that the, the notion that, that, that myth that you mentioned of the, you know, the condition of the neighborhood is based on the inhabitants, you know, if that were true, and, you know, obviously he calls it a myth, but even if that were true, you know, wouldn't you want to put money toward education or towards building businesses, you know, solve some of these problems and then let's let the community thrive. It's very convenient to live in that vacuum and then leave the weight of the problem to the victim. And I do think, you know, like you said, and like Dr. Perry said, and he did a very, very good job of pointing out the realities of what's happening, but also the inconsistencies that keep that reality going, that keep us living in that space. And I think that having those numbers juxtaposed with the clip from Congress was just fantastic because I, I know that these numbers are out there. I know that they are and they, and they have to see them. And it's just, it was really interesting. And I really appreciated him for being so willing to speak on that and to tell to tell the truth in a way that makes it very plain for all to understand. Thank you so much for, for sitting, dialoguing and unpacking this with me. It was such, a, such an informative session and it was really a treat to be able to unpack this and explore this with somebody else who also was able to kind of get to the meat of this and really understand how sobering it was. Yes, I, I agree as well. Um, thank you, Liz, for you know taking time um, to meet. This is a um, was a great uh, experience to be able to hear from from Dr. Perry and then be able to um, kind of debrief and, and discuss with other um, graduate students. So I appreciate um, the opportunity to have taken part in this discussion. Absolutely.